can remove. Dude, this is so freaky. Yes, this is really freaky. Now, remember I said this is the science of hope. This doesn't sound hopeful the way it I'm describing it. yet. <laughs> well, now I'm gonna close the, the loop here. The, the hopeful part is that what you can put on, you can take off. That's what we're learning. There are uh, these processes that mark your genes with these events, but there are also processes that will take them off. And now we're gonna go full circle where you and I started. One of the ways that that has been discovered, and I'm talking about just within the last few years, is through certain phytochemicals in your diet that modulate the ability to replace these uh, marks on the genes in such a way as you get off the bad parts of your book of life, the alarm parts, the inflammatory parts, and re, um, give the ability to really express the good parts of your book of life, hope, you know, joy, uh, love, the goodness that's in your genes. So we have that ability. This is the currency of 21st century. That's why it's a science of hope. This is a major transition. In school, I can tell you, through my medical school training, through my PhD training, which was now a number of decades ago, this was thought not to happen at all. In fact, if you would have brought this up as a student in my era, you would have been extrigated from school because they, no, no, the genes don't change their expression. Once you got them, that's all there. It's a one-way street. That is not like true. like that when I was a kid. Yeah, it's yeah. not true. Okay, so we have the ability to take it off the way the marks on the um, our genes, and you have talked about hey nobody talks about the people talk about RDA for like protein, fat, sugar, uh, but they don't talk about it for the phytochemicals. Right. So what phytochemicals should we be eating, and where doth we find them? Oh uh, yeah. And uh, I'll I'll tease a punchline. I don't take supplements almost ever. And in researching you, I was like, yeah, I'm buying a supplement of that. So what what are the things we should be eating to get our proper amount of phytochemicals that are going to positively impact the epigenetic expression of our genes? Yeah, wow. So this is such an incredible moment in our opportunity as a culture mm. to redefine how we want to see ourselves going forward, how we can become more self-dependent on uh, achieving our health outcomes of desired function and uh, not depend upon crisis care to be the rescue for our ills. And what has been learned is uh, that certain foods that are high in flavonoids, these, this is a family of phytochemicals, and this has drawn me in like full on uh, because I, <laughs> you know, there are no coincidences of life I've come to recognize. We're drawn into thinking things are coincidences because they happen together, but we're probably likely to have had them because of the things that we're dealing with and who we're hanging out with and the conversations we're having. So what we think is happenstance probably was more designed to, to give that right that observation because of experiences that we're having. So for me, I had three experiences all happened within a couple of months of one another. One, I met this investigator at Vanderbilt University Medical School who was doing this extraordinary work on discovering a new way to manage blood, high blood pressure through the immune system. And I had never thought about uh, that the immune system had some relationship with uh, blood pressure. Mm. So I got discussing and looking at his papers and, and uh, it turned out that he had found a molecule, uh, it has the scientific name 2-hydroxylbenzylamine called 2-HOBA, that was capable of modulating the relationship between the immune system and the wall of our blood vessels to cause it to relax, which lowers blood pressure. Mm. And so I thought, well, that's kind of cool. Where does that, where does this two- The immune system is communicating with the walls of our blood vessels? Oh, absolutely. Because the immune system is going in and out of the vascular what? epithelium all the time. It's it's prospecting. It's, it's searching for, that's where atherosclerosis and immunity tie together, heart disease and an inflamed immune system. Oh. So, let me just close by saying, I asked the question, then where is this 2 hova located? And as I read the paper carefully down in the fine print of the paper, he pointed out there's only one source in the natural world of this in foods, and it's in something called Himalayan tartary buckwheat. There it is. I knew this was going to be part of the punchline. And, I ordered some. I and, was like, and, yeah, I and, well, I got some for you. And, and, I, and I never heard of Himalayan tartary buckwheat. You know, that, like you, you know, all I you literally, had to do. At first I was like, what are you saying? You, you're so used to saying it, you say it so fast. <laughs> Himalayan tartary. Yes. Two it T's. It comes from T -A -R -T? the. T-A-R-T? Whatever. Uh, yeah, it comes from the Himala uh, the Tartan district of China on the on the flanks of the Himalayan mountains. Okay. It's a 25 And it's not a wheat, we should tell people that. It's not it's a my grain. Wife would otherwise it's not a grain, it's a seed. It's a fruit seed. 
It's been consumed for 2,500 years as a central food in harsh environments, mm. in the blue zones, in the Himalayas. So I got this, this aha. Then the next part of the coincidence was I asked my colleague that's worked with me now. She's very patient. She's been with me for over 25 years working, and so she kind of knows where my strange thoughts go. I said, are you familiar with uh, Himalayan tartary buckwheat at all? She said, no, I have never heard of it. I said, is there, where is it grown in the United States? She said, well, Jeff, you're going off to this meeting in China, in Harbin, China, so why don't you let me think about this and I'll do some sleuthing and when you come back, we can talk about it, which she did. So I went off to China and was had a, a, a guide host, MD-PhD, um, Shanghai East gentleman that was US trained. Um, and we went to Harbin and I had a chance to speak to 8,000 Chinese medical doctors in their annual health check about uh, health check center meeting about functional medicine. So I got on the train with him and here we go, you know, for a day trip to uh, Shanghai. And we get about halfway across China and we're going through these extraordinary agricultural areas and then a city would pop out with a million people out of nowhere. So I said to him, I, I said, um, just as a, a kind of a flyer, I wonder if you're familiar with something called Himalayan Tartary Buckwheat. And as if time froze, like the, like the train stopped, his eyes got very big and he said, you gotta be kidding me. And I said, no, he says, we have been looking for someone in the United States for some years that had an interest in Himalayan Tartary Buckwheat because my group is the largest research group studying it and it's, it's health benefits and physiology in China. Hmm. So then I got back and was telling um, my colleague that I had met this person and we were going to form a partnership. And she said, well, you know, I found the only person who grows Himalayan tartary buck in the United States is a former Cornell University Ag Research Professor and his wife, who's a nurse, they have a hobby farm. He's retired and he's been growing this now and they, they, they mill it themselves and they have little roadside uh, stands up in upstate New York, in Angelica, New York. And uh, so you got to talk with him. Sam Beer was his name, I called him. We, we now formed a cooperative, a Himalayan Tartary Organic uh, Cooperative, doing regenerative agriculture of a number of farmers up there. Now we are farming for the first time ever in what, America. What are the phytochemicals in it, though, that make it so? Because yes. I know that they have, whatever, a hundred times the amount of phytochemicals in yep. them that whatever the next closest thing has. But what exactly is it? Yeah. And what is the message that it's sending to our immune system? Thank you. So it's a portfolio of about 50 different um, members of the flavonoid and the polyphenol family. So you have rutin, you have quercetin, you have luteolin, you have diasmin, you have vesperidin. All in one plant. All in one plant. It's an orchestra. And you know that's one of the problems we have, I think, with nutritional supplementation in this country and the way we view it is we, we often think about green pharmacy. Okay, we have a drug for such and such. Now what is the nutrient that we find that mimics that drug? That's actually not the way nature works. Nature works symphonically. It has a whole different mechanism. It's network biology. They work together to, uh, hormetically is the term, hormesis, to modulate the functions that then regulate how our body functions. It's a different than blocking or inhibiting a specific product like uh, does a drug. Mm -hmm. It's really orchestrating the symphonic orchestration of how our body works. And so we're looking at how it actually imprints the human immune system with epigenetic marks to regulate how the immune system functions. Okay, so let me start putting some things together. So the immune system is communicated to by the immune system of plants. The harsher the environment the plant grows up in, the more that the immune system is um, Developed. I'm not sure what the right way to think of that is, but they create more phytochemicals, phytonutrients. Maybe it's broader than um, one simple thing. It's the whole symphony. Um, but given that when the human immune system grows up in trauma, it becomes overreactive, why is it so awesome? Because that's part of what makes Himalayan tartary buckwheat so effective is it grows up in like this heinous environment uh, and it doesn't do cross-pollinization, it self-pollinates, which that's I didn't even right. know was a it thing. It protects its genes. Yeah, you know. so it's this sort of really pure thing that's grown up in this insanely difficult environment. Um, why doesn't that become overreactive and then trigger our immune system? Really, really important question. So if you think of our experience of life from really even the moment we were conceived up through whatever age we are, uh, we're collecting all these experiences because our immune system is everywhere in the body and has a, a really good memory. Mm. So it remembers all these events. It remembers the great days, 
It remembers the not so good days. It remembers the infections and the colds. It remembers the broken arm and the trauma that might have, all these events. Uh, now some of those uh, are so um, strong in, in the way that they impact epigenetically our immune system that they lock the immune system into a state of feeling it's in, under constant siege. That leads to this state of chronic inflammation because the immune system constantly feels like it's doing battle even if it's not supposed to be doing battle. These cells, and they, they have names like zombie cells, that's a pretty <laughs> descriptive term. They're cells that perpetuate the message of alarm. And by the way, um, you know, I, I, I have come from an athletic background. I was involved with uh, university sports. I played basketball um, in university level. And so the, the construct of, of athletes who are constantly forcing to the edge and, and trauma is part of their training and part of their experience, they're collecting injuries. So how do we get them to rejuvenate their cells? It's not only the, the muscle cells and the joint and cartilage cells, it's the immune cells. And so what we often find is, is people that are involved with athletic competition benefit from this process of immunorejuvenation because all of us are collecting marks. Some people at a more uh, accelerated level. If you had SARS-CoV-2 infection and you're in post-COVID, you probably have marks that, that we call scars, right, on your immune system. Now, how do you get rid of them? You do so through this process because the body can rejuvenate its immune system by replacing new cells for the old ones, getting rid of the old ones by a process that's only recently been discovered. It won a Nobel Prize in Medicine in 2014 called autophagy. Autophagy is a self-digestion process to get rid of debris and now give room to replace it with new cells. So the combination of rejuvenating through autophagy of your immune system plus getting rid of epigenetic marks gives the opportunity to roll back the age of your immune system and its function. But why does that